For all of you who thought it was going to be a quiet Saturday morning, it is not. I'm Elizabeth. President Donald Trump jolting the world awake this morning with a shocking accusation on Twitter. The Obama administration was tapping phones in Trump Tower just before the election. Fox News is working on this developing story, and we start today with reaction from our Lago, Florida, where the president is spending his weekend. Kristen Fisher is standing by with the very latest. Kristen, what can you tell us? Well, Liz, these are explosive allegations. If true, it could lead to the indictment of a former president and his staff. But if false, then this president who accuses just an entire arsenal of ammunition against him. Now, here are the accusations from President Trump just this morning. He tweeted out, quote, terrible. Just found out that Obama had my wires tapped in Trump Tower just before the victory. Nothing found. This is McCarthyism. In a second tweet, he said, how low has President Obama gone to tap my phones during the very sacred election process? This is Nixon Watergate, bad or sick guy. Now, President Trump has so far offered zero proof, zero evidence to back up these claims. So where is all of this coming from? Well, yesterday there was a report in Breitbart, uh, and that Breitbart report uh, was referencing some claims made by a conservative radio host, Mark Levin, and he claimed that President Obama had tried to execute a silent coup of President Trump by using, quote-unquote, police state tactics. And those tactics allegedly included wiretapping Trump Tower. Now, again... These are just allegations, but these reports claim that last June, in the middle of the election, the Obama administration submitted a FISA request. That's the operative uh, okay, some campaigns. It was reportedly turned down, but then in October, right before the election, right when all of the allegations about the Trump campaign and Russia were heating up, it was reportedly renewed. Now, our Brett Bayer asked House Speaker Paul Ryan about this very claim just last night, and here was his response. Have you heard that? Well, again, and, and like I said, none of us in Congress uh, or anybody that I know in Congress has been presented with evidence uh, to the contrary of what you just said. So you believe it to be true? Yeah, that, that we have seen no evidence that anybody in this campaign um, or any other American was in on it with the Russians to meddle in our elections. We know they meddled. Uh, Russia is an adversary, uh, and that's something we have to work to counteract. Now, so far, there's been no official response from former President Barack Obama, uh, but one of his former aides, Ben Rhodes, just tweeted out, no president can order a wiretap. Those restrictions were put in place to protect citizens from people like you. And he was referring to President Donald Trump in that tweet. So any chance of the former administration and the current administration getting along and playing nice? Uh, I think just, it's safe to say that that's over now. In the words of Senator Lindsey Graham, he was commenting uh, on all of this just this morning, he said, if true, or even if it turns out to be false, really, either way, this could be the biggest political scandal since Watergate. Liz? All right, we'll follow it. Kristen Fisher reporting live. Kristen, thank you so much. And a great segue because there's more fallout on President Trump's tweet this morning. Senator Lindsey Graham spoke out at a town hall in Clemson, South Carolina. I'll make a comment about the latest tweet. Have you seen it? Yeah. So apparently this morning, President uh, Trump tweeted out There you go from Senator Lindsey Graham. Help us follow the bouncing tweets here. Gregory Cordy of USA Today. Good to see you, sir. Sure. All right. We, we all thought we were going to have a quiet morning. Evidently, Mr. Trump's aides thought they were going to have a quiet morning. And then they, like all of us, woke up to this. Uh, help us unpack here. What What's new here? We've seen these reports before that there was perhaps a request to a FISA court, which is the secret court for national security, for wiretaps against a couple of Trump aides. There's a big distance between that and President Obama, quote unquote, ordering Mr. Trump's phones tapped. 
Yeah, anytime you see an early morning tweet from President Trump, you really have to figure out what he was watching or what he was reading immediately before he tweeted that. It looks that. like probably a Breitbart article from Thursday or Friday. Which referenced a Mark Levin uh, rant on, on talk radio, which referenced a uh, blog, an, an old and unsubstantiated uh, story back from November that uh, somehow the Obama administration, the FBI, was tapping wiretapping Trump Tower in an effort to figure out Russian connections between the Trump campaign and some Russian banks. Um, that has now resurfaced because the President of the United States tweeted. It's not something but any the, of us the, were talking the, the, about. The President of the United States says something. It's news, Absolutely. whether it is true or not, whether it is relevant at that moment or not. To that point, uh, your colleague over at the Washington Post, Robert Costa, great reporter by all accounts, sent this out this morning. Trump left White House in fury on Friday, fuming about Sessions. It's recused to follow up from Mike Allen saying in Trump's mind, an inch of retreat, even if facts seemingly demand an apology, is unforgivable. Is that perhaps the answer to the question, why now? Look, uh, President Trump has had a roller coaster of a week, right? Uh, on Tuesday, he delivered Incredible. A, a speech that exceeded all expectations. He basked in that for most of Wednesday before these latest uh, revelations came out about uh, Jeff Sessions' uh, contacts with the Russian ambassador. Um, President Trump, on the aircraft carrier uh, USS Gerald Ford, told reporters, no, Sessions should not recuse himself. Sessions later that day recused, recused himself. himself. And so that's where you have uh, this sort of whiplash by the White House um, having to respond to events. All right, so now all of a sudden, the president has managed to pull everybody off the Sessions story, essentially, pull everybody off of the Russian involvement story. Now attention is focused on, was there some type of surveillance on the Trump campaign by the administration or by the DOJ? If true, as Senator Graham pointed out, explosive. So how does this story develop? Well, I mean, certainly we have not heard anything from uh, President Obama himself. In, in, President Obama himself would not order something like this uh, under the, the, well, he, the he, system of laws that we have. Conceivably, the president really can't order it the, unless, unless it is Watergate. You have to go through the absolutely. FISA court and get a warrant. Absolutely. So if something like this is happening, it's happening in the FBI, and it's secret for, for obvious reasons, either there is a criminal investigation against Trump himself or members of his campaign, or this is a FISA court investigation in which the, uh, the FBI is investigating foreign nationals and their contact with U.S. persons who they believe may be acting as agents of a foreign power. Either way, if there is an investigation, that's not good for, for Trump and his White House. Well, and conceivably, the Attorney General is the one who would run such an investigation. He has said he's going to recuse himself. So what happens? We, we've heard from the White House in the past couple of minutes that they're sort of scrambling to try to figure out what's going on behind the scenes, see if they can get some more information to get out. So who, who's running things at the Department of Justice this weekend if Jeff Sessions has recused himself? Well, then it would fall to the uh, Deputy Attorney General, who uh, is uh, currently acting at this Dana Buente. He was the acting Attorney General before uh, Jeff Sessions was, was sworn in. He's the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, the the uh, Trump's nominee for Deputy Attorney General is uh, has a confirmation vote coming up in the Senate. Um, but that, yeah, that, the, that confirmation hearing just got a lot more interesting. It, it, it did get a lot more. Uh, it does. Uh, thicken the plot. Yeah, absolutely. Ra and raises the stakes, for sure. And, and obviously, considering that Senator Sessions at least ran into, shall we say, some complications because of his hearing, you have to think they're all of a sudden retooling, perhaps, and, and going back and scrubbing for this second hearing. Let's remember how uh, the Hillary Clinton got in trouble and how that investigation got off the rails. It was because the Attorney General then, Loretta Lynch, had to recuse herself because she had talked to uh, former President Clinton on in an airplane in, in Arizona and had to recuse herself, leaving uh, Jim Comey, the FBI director, in charge of the investigation. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Yeah. There to cover it all, Mr. Cordy, appreciate it. We'll be reading your stuff in USA Today. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks. Liz? All right, let's continue some parts of that conversation with allegations of perjury and calls for his resignation swirling on Capitol Hill. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has agreed to clarify statements he made under oath during his confirmation hearings, possibly as early as Monday. Democrats are demanding details about Sessions' pre-election contacts with Russia officials. Lauren Blanchard has more on this developing story. Lauren, what can you tell us? Hi, Liz. According to the Depar Department of Justice, Attorney General Jeff Sessions will not answer Democrats' questions in person, instead in writing on Monday. This after nine Senate Democrats sent a letter to Judiciary Committee
Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley asking for Sessions to be called for a public hearing to explain why he did not disclose recently discovered conversations with the Russian ambassador during his confirmation hearing. Senator Grassley has since denied the request, and this as Democrats say Sessions recusing himself from any investigation into Russia and election hacking isn't good enough. For him to say, well, I was just meeting with him, the normal course of a senator meeting with a, an ambassador, the Russian ambassador, who everybody knew was hacking our system, is it, beyond naive. It's almost pathetic. Meanwhile, Republicans are trying to save face as another one of President Trump's key officials has charges of Russian ties leveled against them. Republicans say that Sessions recusing himself from the investigation isn't necessary, but it may help the credibility of the Justice Department. He listened to advice of uh, people within the Justice Department on how best to maintain the integrity and the independence of the Justice Department. And so I think he, he I don't think he had to do this, but I think he did what he thought was in the best interest of the Justice Department, which I think is fine. Uh, he was a surrogate for the campaign. And so I think he just wanted to err on the side of caution and remove any shred of doubt or concern whatsoever by doing that. Russian allegations have already brought down one of President Trump's cabinet, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, and now Democrats are calling for Sessions to step down. But Republicans say that what Sessions did by meeting with the Russian ambassador while still a congressman isn't illegal, nor did he perjure himself in confirmation hearings. Liz. All right, Lauren Blanchard reporting live. Thank you so much. All right, let's talk about another top story, believe it or not, this weekend. Senator Rand Paul is on the hunt still for a draft of the health care bill. And, of course, we're going to get to that in a moment. But first, I asked him when he visited us here in studio about Attorney General's recusal. Well, I think on both sides of the aisle, there's been a little bit of misremembering which ambassadors they met with. You know, we had someone on the other side of the aisle come out and say she had never met with the Russian ambassador. And then someone looked at her Twitter feed and sure enough, she had met with the Russian ambassador. So I think it's one, it's easy to forget if you've met with people over time. But I think in this case, if I were looking at that testimony, I've read the testimony, he sort of asked, uh, did the campaign have anything to do with the Russians? And his first impression was like, well, no, we didn't have anything to do with the Russians. That he wasn't thinking about in his capacity, I think, as senator. So I don't think he meant to try to mislead. I think he just honestly thought that that wasn't the same. And he didn't think through, oh, gosh, I had a meeting on August 3rd. But who would try to obscure that when everybody knows your schedule is somewhat public and that it would come forward? So I don't really think that he meant to mislead. I think he just thought he was talking about the campaign, not his official capacity as a senator. Part of his response was that the leaks are being hyped beyond reason. It's, it was a little bit out of control there's been the word um, witch hunt being used. Agree or disagree? Well, I think there have been things that are very, very important that have been leaked that are uh, felonies. So, for example, if I call a foreign leader on the phone, like Mike Flynn called the Russian ambassador on the phone, I understand we may be eavesdropping on people because we think they're spying in our country, but the American that makes the phone call, presidents make phone calls to foreign leaders, the information that goes on in that conversation, I would think it would be about as classified as it comes. And if we have people in the White House, and some of them may have been President Obama's appointees or career officials, if they're leaking the content of conversations between our leaders and foreign leaders, that's a very, very serious crime. And that's what many of us worry about, that you could end up having an NSA that collects so much information on us that we could be blackmailed by our own government. Yeah, I don't think this is the last we're going to hear about it. There has been discussions and media reports that House members will be voting on a repeal and replace as early as this month. Um, I want to know, have you gained any access? We saw you uh, <laughs> up and down the hills of the Capitol. Yeah. We saw you with a, a cart and a copy machine, and you were trying to gain access to see a copy of this. Have you yet? The I have not. question of the day. I, I know it exists, but <laughs> I have not been given access to it. And I guess that's what troubled us, is we read news reports that it was available, but it was under lock and key, top security clearance. Is that really unusual? Um, very unusual. And the fact that you could only get into it if you're on the committee and you could only you couldn't take it. Even the committee members couldn't take it. I think that's a big mistake. And I think once anybody in the public, you know, conservative Republicans don't like sort of the establishment Republicans doing this, but nobody likes it, Republican or Democrat, if a bill's completely created in secret and nobody gets to see it. What if what if they say, listen, we just want to get it right? We we've waited this long, we want to get every detail. And what if they're looking at ways 
ways to compromise because right. we know you have a totally different proposal, right. and they just want to they want to present it to the Senate in, in a, a form that I, they. I think need. it's I think it's worse than that though. I think conservatives don't want Obamacare light, and we think what they're creating is Obamacare light. Now, what is you, Obamacare light? I'll give you three instances that are in the bill that we object to. There's a new entitlement program. So if you don't pay any taxes, they're going to give you back taxpayer money, a significant amount, and it's going to be based then its growth over time on inflation about five percent increase a year that's a new entitlement program so we're going Those to are the tax credits that's the tax credits they're refundable tax credits it's just not a republican type of ideal to me it's a a democrat idea they're trying to dress up in republican clothing that to me is obamacare light they're keeping the cadillac tax they're kind of renaming it and making it a little bit different but essentially if you have really good insurance they're going to tax it and then the third thing they're doing is they're keeping a form of the individual mandate. You remember everybody complained, all Republicans said, individual mandate's terrible. They're keeping it, but instead of you paying a penalty to the government, you're going to have to be, and it's a mandate, it's a law, you're going to have to pay a penalty to the insurance company. Your proposal is to just go back and vote on the, the repeal and just do a blanket, a, a clean yeah, I have two proposals. Two proposals. One, clean repeal. And I think all conservatives will be on board. We did this a year but ago. But millions will be uninsured. Let me finish. I'm for clean repeal and the same day a separate vote on replacement. I wouldn't put them together because there is some disagreement on replacement. So what I'm saying is vote on a clean repeal, everything, and then vote on a replacement the same day. What if the repeal goes through and the replacement doesn't? I can't guarantee what wins and loses. I'm just telling you the only way they're going to get repeal is they're going to, if they want to get conservative votes, they're going to have to give us a clean repeal like we voted on before. But if you want conservatives to stay on board, you know, you've heard from the House Freedom Caucus. That's 40 members of Congress. You've heard from three of the senators on our side. That is enough to stop them. They're going to have to negotiate with us. With all these different bills and proposals, you're going to have people who say, listen, you're preventing progress. It's just way too much going on. Way, no, way I'm, too I'm, much. I think we should get it right. I think we should completely repeal Obamacare. It's been terrible for the American public. Insurance rates have gone through the roof. Nobody likes it. it we're, we're suffering this downward spiral of it. It's a terrible, terrible system. Let's get rid of it. But then let's also say, you know, we have different ideas on replacement. We're unified as Republicans for repeal. We're not so unified on replacement. Separate replacement. Let's vote on a couple different versions. But that's the way it should be in democracy. Try to get people to come together for your ideas. But if they force us to have big government replacement kind of bills, Obamacare light on the repeal bill, they're not going to win. I think one of the things that I found most fascinating because we saw Speaker Ryan on Brett Baer last night and he had, had said that, uh, that he's fond of, of um, Rand Paul but he thinks that this is a little bit of a publicity stunt and the fact that, they, that they're working on it and they're marking up the bill isn't something that he says is unusual. So you're certainly hearing two well, very... Any, any time you call the press to follow you through Capitol Hill with a copy machine on a dolly it does perhaps call into questions if it's a publicity stunt, but uh, he's trying to get his there you go. Out. Well, he he has an un he certainly has a way of doing that. No one ever no one ever doubts that. As does Mr. Trump have a way of getting his point across. More on the tweet storm uh, coming up throughout the show and this. Back to health care, emotions running high over Obamacare at town halls like this one, led by Senator Lindsey Graham today in Clemson, South Carolina. More on what happened after he was shouted down. And we'll break down the impact of President Trump's proposed defense spending increases. So what will it actually give our military? After years of endless budget cuts that have impaired our defenses, I am calling for one of the largest defense spending increases in history. A Fox News alert updating you on the tweets this morning of President Trump accusing President Obama of authorizing wiretaps on him during the campaign. This from Serafin Gomez of our White House unit. Current Obama spokesman tells Fox News to expect some sort of reaction from their camp, meaning President Obama's camp, re-President Trump's tweets. They, meaning President Obama's team, are fired up. We'll see what reaction we get throughout the show. 
Other top story this weekend, members of the powerful House Ways and Means Committee are working through the weekend to hammer out their version of Obamacare replacement. We're going to be speaking to chairman of that committee, Texas Republican Kevin Brady, next hour about Obamacare and Mr. Trump's tweets as well. Until now, the process of repealing and replacing Obamacare has been cloaked in secrecy. But in South Carolina today, Senator Lindsey Graham has been getting an earful from constituents worried about the fate of their health care coverage. Ritz Etzen monitoring this and some of the other town halls around the country. And we, we saw this all last week. We've sort of seen it again now. Yeah, and we saw it a few years ago and so much for an easy weekend. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham is fielding questions on Russian interference in the 2016 election, police profiling, and that topic that's dominated most of these congressional town halls health care. In that rowdy Clemson, South Carolina town hall, Graham joined Democrats and fellow Republican Senator Rand Paul in criticizing Republican leaders for, as Graham says, acting like Democrats did in 2009, writing their health care proposal privately among a small group of lawmakers. Can I give you a little secret? I don't even know what the GO plan is, GOP plan is. <laughs> Let me tell you, did y'all see Rand Paul on TV? You know, Rand and I don't drill much, but he's right about this. What was our big knock on Obamacare? They did it without any of us. Graham does say the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, is driving up costs and Republicans are right to replace it. Congressional Republican leaders say the House Ways and Means Committee will soon unveil their initial proposal and then Democrats and Republicans will have an opportunity to amend or change it. Vice President Mike Pence joined House Speaker Paul Ryan in Wisconsin yesterday. Pence says he expects in a matter of days a very brisk pace of legislative activity. Republicans are generally proposing to give Americans tax credits to buy private insurance plans that are less regulated than Obamacare insurance. Democrats claim the idea's Republican support will leave millions without sufficient health coverage. And as Democrats oppose the Republican effort, even Republicans are at odds over how to rewrite the U.S. health care system again. Deja vu all over again. Quick question for you. We hear from the vice president saying, hey, there's going to be this brisk activity. How is this different than when we heard back in January and early February? Oh, a couple of weeks. What congressional will unveil that within the committee and then they have what's called a markup where Democrats and Republicans can actually propose in public changes. That's the thing. They have yet to, in a formal so we, we setting, announce it. might actually get to read this before they pass it. There might it. actually be a piece of paper out wow. there what, what, from a committee as opposed to all these ideas from different Republicans. Well, they, you know, if, you, if you want five ideas in Congress, just ask for congressman right. thanks rich liz and of course keep it right here on fox news all weekend for the latest on the trump administration media buzz will be speaking with katrina pearson a former trump campaign spokesperson now she's a part of a pro-trump nonprofit. she'll be speaking about the coverage of sessions recusal that's tomorrow at 11 a.m eastern and on fox news sunday chris wallace will be speaking to two senators tom cotton and chris coons about the latest over the ties between russia in the Trump administration. Check your local listings for time and channel. Coming up, from leaks to finger pointing, the Trump administration's involvement with Russia heats up as lawmakers demand for an independent investigation. We're gonna take a look at the consequences for the new administration. Plus, a campaign promise to rebuild America's military. Up next, just how much money will come out of taxpayers' pockets to foot the bill. And right now you are looking at live pictures of a pro-Trump rally in Raleigh, North Carolina. Of course, if you've been virtually tonight across the country to the administration, but we're all, all also starting to see some of these rallies in favor of Donald Trump's agenda. This is just one of several planned for today across the country. We know there is also one planned for Trump Tower and then here in D.C. at the Washington Monument. Of course, we're going to uh, follow all of these rallies and we'll bring you any news uh, that dips out. And speaking of Mr. Trump, we're continuing to get reaction from President Trump's bombshell tweet this morning accusing President Obama of wiretapping Trump Tower during the election. We are waiting for a response from the Obama.
Obama folks, but in the meantime, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi tweeted this, quote, the deflector in chief is added again, an investigation by an independent commission only with Congress aisle, but later in the show. President Trump is proposing a $54 billion increase in military spending. That's nearly 10 percent. But he may not have an easy time getting the plan passed. Mackenzie Eglin is a national security analyst with American Enterprise Institute, and she joins us now live. Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad that you're here to break this all down. When we initially heard that, that he was going to take um, some funds from, from other uh, areas of the budget, if you will, and, and then pump it into the military. What was your reaction and, and how does it impact the overall annual budget for the military? So I think there's a plurality of Congress that supports growing the defense budget and building up the military. Is this how you do it though? Yeah, well, that's the issue, right? So Mr. Trump is proposing a partisan way to go about it, and you're going to need Democratic votes to get this passed. And by cut it, by growing defense and cutting non-defense discretionary, so basically, you know, programs like Head Start or Environmental Protection Agency, National Endowment for the Arts, State Department, even foreign aid, uh, that's going to be a non-starter in Congress. There just aren't enough votes to pass it uh, because they're leaving entitlements, you know, Social Security off the table. Right. The, the money has to go. The ha has to come from somewhere. So we did see some some of uh, the places where he was going to cut. You mentioned the State Department. You mentioned the EPA. Um, and we also heard that obviously NOAA was going to get slashed as well. Um, what type of impact does that have on those organizations? And like you said, is it really a non-starter? Is it dead on arrival with some of these congressmen and women? It's absolutely dead on arrival. Not only would you have a unified Democratic Party, but you can pick up a lot of Republicans. Uh, Lindsey Graham has already said this can't pass Congress as it is and so frankly what you see is Washington is big government no matter what the proposal and Mr. Trump's gonna have to find a way to cut a deal and it's not gonna include cuts of this magnitude. So how does he do that? So he's probably going to have to grow everything, uh, but perhaps by a lesser magnitude. So maybe say a dollar for defense, you know, one dollar increase that goes to defense, maybe you get a 30 cent increase equivalent for non-defense programs. But if, if, you're, if you're a member of the military, I mean, how do you react to this if you're not quite sure what's, what the funding is going to look like? Right. How do you react to that? It's a huge problem for the Pentagon. So this is the largest federal agency, right? They spend over a half trillion dollars annually. They do long-term five and 20 and 30 year planning. And to not know what their budget's going to be is very disruptive to a department that buys roughly $350 billion a year in goods and services. So they can't move forward with all of their plans. Well, I think that, that the president is in a little bit of a conundrum here because this is, this is what he, he ran on. I mean, this is, this is off it. For, I guess I'm a little perplexed as to why folks are so surprised at the, that the news that he's making these cuts and he's putting the money elsewhere right. because this is why he was elected. Yes, that's right. It's fair enough. I mean, he, he publicized what he was going to do, and now he's doing it. Grow the military and cut government. He's trying to do both. What he's going to find out, however, being new to Washington, is that there aren't enough votes to follow him with his own plan. And so it's going to be a complicated, messy process, I fear, getting to that defense buildup. Okay, so what do you foresee for the next couple of months? Because obviously we're going to be talking about the budget more and more. Right. Is there going to be some type of a compromise? And what could that compromise look like? So I think first you're going to see Congress take a series of votes to show that Mr. Trump's budget can or can't pass. And of course it starts in the House where these bills originate. And I think once he realizes in his team that they can't even pass the House, because usually it's the Senate that's the problem. They're going to identify that this is going to lead to other problems because if you can't get a budget passed, then you can't operate in a regular order and pass all the spending bills. So then it's going to look like a do-nothing deal, which Mr. Trump has said he doesn't want to do. I was just going to ask you that. Are we going to hear? Are we going to hear the word entitlement sometime soon? Well, I think there are acceptable uh, approaches uh, in entitlements that both parties can live with that are small. They're not big cuts. They're not big tweaks or changes. It's going to be a hard pill for some from, for some people to swallow. It is, but you know, the, like I said, the plurality, the voting majority of Congress would go along with, I think, some modest changes. Uh, uh, to to entitlements. Mr. Obama, even his team was looking at some of this. He had proposed uh, a couple of changes. If you want a bipartisan bill to pass, which is the only way to get spending bills to pass, right. that's probably going to be the only alternative. All right. Well, this is a developing story, McKenzie. We hope to have you back. Thank you so much. Thanks. Interesting. Leland? Coming up, another day, another twist in the Russian connection. We're going to 
And a look at the latest accusations hitting the Trump White House over connections to Vladimir Putin. And what could go wrong with this? Airport screeners are now allowed to get a little more handsy Why they're having to beef up their security checks. Come on, come on, come on, come on, now touch me, baby. President Trump is using executive powers to restart construction of two major oil pipelines, but one of them will not be made with American steel, despite the president's public comments that it would. The White House says the Keystone XL pipeline, which was started before President Trump took office, has already has the steel already ready to be used and falls outside of the president's executive orders. His directive to use American steel applies only to new pipelines or those being repaired. The president's tweets this morning about alleged wiretapping of Trump Tower during the election refocuses attention on the Russian connection. Revelations this week that Attorney General Jeff Sessions failed to disclose meetings with the Russian ambassador only adds to the story as the president is reportedly angry that the Attorney General recused himself from an investigation, a possible investigation, into Russian intervention. For more insight, let's bring in Nahal Tusi, Politico Foreign Affairs Correspondent. Great having you as always. Old saying in Washington, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's a lot of smoke. Have we found any evidence of real fire yet? Not quite, not quite. Uh, it's, but you have to remember, at the end of the day, this is a big story. The idea that all of our intelligence agencies believe that Russia interfered in our election to help President Trump win. That's not going away. And I just believe that the more that the Trump team tries to push this away, dissemble, say that they didn't know, and then ultimately say, oh yes, we did have meetings, they're not helping themselves. They're kind no, of the, fanning the, the smoke. The, the, the Democrats have said the same thing. We had Nancy Pelosi say, hey, gee, I never met with this Russian ambassador. Then all of a sudden there's pictures of her with the ambassador. Fair she to wasn't under oath. Fair, true. Fair, fair to say, although, although one would hope that politicians tell the truth to us whether they're under oath or not something about as simple as about being in a meeting uh, question though who this Russian ambassador it seems as though if you meet with him he, you're now somehow indicted as being a commie which is a little odd well you know he's Sergei uh, Kislyak is his name and he has been around town for about a decade very well known very well connected um, but yes it does seem like nowadays uh, he's kind of radioactive nobody really wants to, yeah, to not, be in a not, photo not, with him. you know it may, it may be <laughs> tough for him to get an invitation for Thanksgiving this year as a matter of fact he's he canceled he was supposed to be at the gridiron dinner which is a very Washington right. inside the beltway event but he canceled his appearance for tomorrow allegedly over perhaps some kind of skit that was going to go on about Russia and all on all these kinds of things but it it goes to probably a more sort of important point we heard from the Russian Foreign Ministry that all this discussion of Russian intervention smacks of McCarthyism and then this morning we hear the same words from the President of the United States Yes, there do seem to be some echoes uh, between the Russian messaging and the American messaging. Uh, whether Fair to it say is, is the first time that's happened? Uh, it's not the first time, actually. And it, and it seems that... Uh, Give us a history lesson. When was the last time? <laughs> well, the other day, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, said that there's a witch hunt going on. And then suddenly Donald Trump uses the phrase witch hunt as well. So this is, this is something that is very interesting. It depends on what media you're following, what's going on. Maybe some of it's a coincidence. This isn't anything, in a sense, though, this isn't anything new. The, the Russians being involved in American elections, or for that matter, the Americans being involved in other elections uh, in other countries, it's been going on since the Cold War started. Well, but there's a big difference between how involved you are. I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, well, uh, it's up to the American voters, but we would like to have a good relationship with America no matter who wins. And a whole other thing to hack uh, the DNC or the RNC or whatever and only reveal certain what, what emails are the, what are that the do Russians damage. want out of this? I think at the end of the day, they want to cause chaos. In, in, the Western, in the Western world. They, they're probably enjoying seeing the fighting that's going on right now. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, what, what makes them happy to a degree, this is what I, I want, a lot of analysts I'm just say. Stop you one second. We're just getting a flash from the AP right now from Reuters. Make that President Obama's spokesperson now commenting on these allegations in President Trump's tweets. Obama's spokesman denies Trump's claim, says, quote, neither President Obama nor any White House official 
ever ordered surveillance on any U.S. citizen, any suggestion otherwise is simply false. That is a fairly Sherman-esque statement. What do you mean by that? It's it's too it, definitive? No, I'm, I'm saying it is very definitive. I mean, right. there's, this is a full-throated denial in every way, shape, and form. Right, which makes you wonder where President Trump got his information. Uh, was it just from Breitbart News, or well, was it a classified information that he's revealing on Twitter? It does What's seem going though, on? Well, it does seem, in fairness to President Trump, it does seem like there has been reporting from not just Breitbart, but from The Guardian, from The Intercept, among others, that there were wiretaps ordered or approved by the FISA court that may have involved some of his aides looking at a possible Russian connection. Correctly. And when you have 140 characters on Twitter, perhaps you don't quite get that nuance into your language, and that yields a whole brouhaha of confusion and what does he mean and what is he saying. And frankly, it draws more attention to a story that he was probably hoping to get away from. Well, you, you could have thought that you could have resetted that story. To, to your point about sort of the brouhaha, we're hearing from our White House unit that the White House staffers had no idea this was coming out uh, and that they woke up this morning to seeing the same tweets we did and are now sort of trying to go back and figure it out and get some, get some things out later today. We're expecting a little bit more from the White House uh, in the next couple of hours. Uh, Nahal, appreciate your insights. Thanks for having me. Uh, one, one last thing, though, that, that I keep going through with this. Where, where does this go from a foreign policy perspective, especially as it relates to our allies? Well, our allies right now are very skittish. Some of them are wondering, where does America stand? Are we pro-Russia? Are we going to ally with them against we, we've Europe? We've President Trump kind of back off from the idea of a deal with Russia, certainly sort of the positivity that we were hearing from him post the election in the uh, transition isn't what we're hearing right now from him or from somebody like his national security advisor. His secretary of defense has been very pro-NATO. mixed signals. Okay. That's what's happening. And frankly, I don't think that reassures a lot of people overseas. They want predictability. They want a more black and white message com coming from th this administration, and they're not getting it. I would like to add one thing, though. As far as the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kislyak, if he wants to meet with me, I am so happy to do it. I've been trying you'll, you'll to. Host, you'll host a Thanksgiving I, dinner? He is not radioactive to me. I would love to meet with All the right, guy. Well, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, if you're watching, tweet us. We'll set you guys up for lunch. Uh, and, and maybe I could come along as well. You're welcome. All Anytime. Right. I, I, I appreciate it. We'll go Dutch. Good to see you, Nahal. Thank you. Thanks Brad. so much. Liz? All right. More.